years, warfare has evolved to reach a new peak, transitioning from land to naval and aerial combat. Consequently, there has been continuous development of new weapon systems capable of fighting in modern warfare. While the United States has been constantly recognized as the leading country in terms of hypersonic jet engine development, Russia has come into the fray now, introducing its billion-dollar fighter jet engine to dominate the skies. How important is the invention of this aerial marvel? Can other countries compete with this new cutting-edge invention? Join us as we discuss Russia's billion-dollar fighter jet engine in action. The global balance of power has always swung like a pendulum, tilting toward the nations with the highest economic and military power. Over the years, military power has significantly shifted from Europe to North America and vice versa. However, more recently, the United States seems to have taken the lead, progressing its economy and producing weapons of mass destruction ranging from bunker busters to propellers and supersonic jet engines. In the 21st century, warfare seems to have evolved past the shackles of Mach 1 to Mach 3 speed fighter jets, with top nations' eyes set on reaching Mach 6, making them nigh unstoppable in the skies. Imagine a fighter jet capable of stealth and reaching a speed of almost 6,000 kilometers per hour, countering every type of anti-aircraft defense in the world. With little to no trouble at all, a real game changer. However, this technology has been theorized much more easily than actualized. While the concept has been the top country's brainchild, creating a technology of that magnitude requires a lot more than geniuses and willpower, with funding right at the center of it. But what really makes hypersonic technology just so important that every top country is scrambling for a chance at it? Hypersonic technology definitely changes the game at every level, whether in war or just in commercial day-to-day -day traveling. For example, countries like the United States and China have been locked in a race to create the first operational fighter jet. While China has had its bit part failures and successes, they have not really been able to come up with an operational hypersonic jet engine that can be utilized during war or even for commercial flights. On the flip side, the United States has recently turned a corner and finally come up with an experimental hypersonic jet in the SR-72 Son of Blackbird, while also having the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, often called DARPA, on their side, working in tandem to make the project get even strong enough to use in warfare. While the United States takes a huge leap forward in developing this monstrous aerial technology, China has continued with their flight tests, hoping to be the first Indo-Pacific country to create competition for America's lead. However, while the United States remains in the lead and China follows aggressively behind, the world seems to overlook Europe. Russia, meanwhile, has brought the world's attention back with the near completion of its billion-dollar hypersonic fighter jet engine project, completely changing the game and taking the lead. But why was Russia initially overlooked? Ever since the annexation of Crimea in 2014, Russia seemed to have consistently attracted more enemies than friends especially in the West, in the Indo-Pacific regions, where it believed that the Kremlin's annexation of Ukraine was simply born out of a greed to take over the world, bringing back the glory days of the disbanded Soviet Union of the 1990s. Fast forward to the 21st century, and the Kremlin has faced economic and financial restrictions primarily imposed by the United States and supported by other countries, which the Kremlin believes are inspired by the defiant United States. Hence, no one thought that a country fighting a war and suffering restrictions on its economy from most of the global market controllers would have the resources and willpower to not only fund the creation of a hypersonic jet, but also be on the verge of making it operational. Is history really about to be made? While reports suggest that they are nearly there, just how much does their creation compare to the SR-72 Son of Blackbird? While nuclear war was the order of the day back in the mid-40s, aviation now is at the center. Over the years, philosophers and other specialists in war have theorized just how important gaining air superiority is to creating a massive advantage during a war. Like Omar Nelson Bradley once said, air power has become predominant, both as a deterrent to war and in the eventuality of war, as the devastating force to destroy an enemy's potential and fatally undermine his will to wage war.
It would seem that the United States and Russia especially took that to heart with their heated arms race in creating the fastest fighter jet in the world. The SR-72 Son of Blackbird was created and intended for performing the most essential functions of a military aircraft, including intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions. Although the idea seemed original and almost nigh impossible, it didn't come from a vacuum. Rather, it stemmed from the evolution of warfare, including the introduction of anti-access, aerial denial tactics that have become the go-to strategy for opposition countries with limited aerial firepower. Hence, Justin Bronx, a senior research fellow in air power and technology at the Royal United Services Institute, otherwise called RUSI, argued that the rise of the anti-access or aerial denial tactics is a wake-up call for the military to adopt speed more than stealth to negate the risk of getting their aircraft shot out of the sky by surface-to-air missiles after being detected on radar. His advice, paired with a recurrent shooting down of American aircraft in enemy airspaces, prompted the emergence of the SR-72 Son of Blackbird in 2007, when the Skunk Works Department of the Lockheed Martin Advanced Development Programs. The United States Air Force had finally decided to retire the SR-71, hence the idea for a prototype that would be at least two times faster than the retired SR-71 Blackbird. In 2006, the Skunk Works Division started working with Aerojet Rocketdyne, a subsidiary of American defense company L3 Harris that manufactures rocket, hypersonic, and electric propulsive systems for space, defense, civil, and commercial applications. The company was tasked with creating an engine capable of transitioning from zero to Mach 6 speed, generating enough kinetic force to help an aircraft travel at 6,400 miles per hour, hence the deliberation on engine choice. After much thought, Lockheed reached an agreement with Aerojet Rocketdyne to combine their scramjet engine, a supersonic combustion ramjet, with their turbojet engine. Hence, the engine was referred to as a turbine-based combined cycle. The SR-72 Son of Blackbird was always envisioned to have an air-breathing propulsion system, meaning that the engine will rely on using the oxygen from the surrounding air to burn fuel, generating thrust and propelling forward between speeds of Mach 1 and 6. Unlike the rocket engines that carry their liquid oxidizer to burn fuel and propel the aircraft, the Son of Blackbird was going to be completely different as the air-breathing propulsion system would be supporting operation at subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic speeds. But just how did they plan to create a jet that could go from the lowest speed anyone can imagine to hypersonic speed? And how will the engines work? The turbojet engines can naturally function from a resting point or zero to at least Mach 2.2, which is the standard speed in commercial jets and some military jets. The turbojet engine is perfect for takeoff, acceleration, and cruising at subsonic or low supersonic levels, giving it relatively frightening speed. However, the United States Air Force had a much stronger requirement, which could only be met by combining the turbojet with the scramjet. The scramjet engines remain in position and docile until the aircraft is moving. When it accelerates to over Mach 2.5 using the turbojet engine, the scramjet takes over and accelerates up to Mach 6, depending on how fast the pilot wishes to go. But just how are these engines combined during flight? Lockheed Martin came up with a genius aerodynamic system where the engines are joined together with the same inlet and nozzle with which they take in air, and then a valve redirects the airflow from the turbojet engine into the scramjet engine when the aircraft is traveling beyond Mach 2.5. This completely changed the game for the United States, establishing them as the top dog in aerial warfare. However, questions remain about the importance of having a combined turbojet and scramjet engine to cater towards achieving Mach 6 speed and beyond. Well, the reason for that is that there isn't an engine in the world capable of going from zero to Mach 6 without stalling or risking a genuine explosion of the whole aircraft. Hence the emergence of this complex engineering it's like a James Bond movie, where a car turns into a boat, then a ship becomes a submarine, all while sharing the same hull. But this time, think about it in aircraft. More importantly, the two engines in question can only work at a certain velocity. 
For some context, the turbojet engine will stall and explode should it be forced to take on more than an average speed of Mach 2 to Mach 2.2. While the scramjet doesn't even work at all until the aircraft is moving in full flow and hits Mach 4. The United States Air Force noted that having a hypersonic jet will definitely shorten an adversary's reaction time to operations. Imagine an aircraft that could travel at six times the speed of sound, going behind enemy airspace for stealth or reconnaissance missions, and maybe even strike if authorized and going back to base before the enemy realizes what has hit them. While the aircraft engine remains in construction, Questions linger over what kind of material and hardware would be needed by the aircraft to handle such speed. Aircraft travel has always had to do with energy and friction. The atmosphere definitely contains air. Therefore, when an aircraft travels through the atmosphere, it pushes the air consistently, displacing a massive volume of it, eventually generating a lot of friction, which then creates heat buildup. However, there are metals capable of handling travel at Mach 2.2, but at Mach 6, there is an increased speed, so the air is being pushed back more, generating more friction in the process and enough heat to nearly set the aircraft ablaze. Hence, as important as it is to get an engine that could possibly transition from turbojet to scramjet to kickstart it at Mach 4, getting the required materials to build an aircraft that could manage such speed without being set on fire before completing a trip and returning to base was just as important. It's like taking a ride on a bike. Imagine traveling at low speed at first. The rider feels a gush of air pushing back gently against their face. But as soon as they accelerate, the air moves back faster and it gets more intense and just a little hotter than it used to be. Now imagine that with aircraft traveling at a hypersonic speed, not only does it create drag, but it also heats the metal and in some cases might ignite it. It is mainly referred to as aerodynamic heating. At speeds of Mach 6 and above, aerodynamic heating generates temperatures sufficient to melt conventional metallic airframes, prompting engineers to consider making critical components from composites, such as high-performance carbon, ceramic, and metal mixes used in intercontinental ballistic missiles and the retired space shuttle. Although the mixed component solution has been discussed extensively, the aerodynamic heating problem remains. However, reports have consistently suggested that the first prototype will eventually be released by the Lockheed Martin company and will possibly be equipped with the technology to launch hypersonic missiles. While the world anticipates its eventual release, some of the superpowers, especially China and Russia, are now in a race against time to create their own engines in a bid to rival the United States SR-72 Son of Blackbird. Although the United States has pushed the envelope further than nearly anyone while experimenting with different ways to increase aerial dominance, Russia has pushed back with the development of the Azdelia 30. The Azdelia 30 is an afterburning low bypass turbofan engine being developed by NPO Saturn to succeed the Saturn AL 41F1 for improved results in their fighter jet, Sukhoi 57. While the United States remains in a limbo on the possibility of reaching the production stage with the turbine-based combined cycle as their only hope but struggles to push the envelope from the turbojet engines, Mach 2.2 MAX, to jump immediately to Mach 4 and activate the scramjet, Russia decided not to push the envelope too far. Instead, they created an advanced variable cycle turbofan engine with thrust vectoring capability that could foster supercruise meaning that it helps the aircraft sustain a level of supersonic speed without turning on the afterburners, reducing the thermal signature, and consequently making it nigh impossible to detect on the opposition's radar. Although the Izadili 30, or Saturn AL-51, as it is often dubbed in parts of Russia, can only go up to Mach 2, the Russians have come up with a mind-blowing game-changer that could open up the possibility of having a multiple propulsion mode like the turbine-based combined cycle that is being designed for the son of Blackbird. However, Russia has taken it all to the next level. While they are mostly borrowing a play from the United States manual with taking inspiration from the turbine-based combined cycle engine, they have actually been able to settle on a turbofan engine that is supercharged enough to push the envelope enough to hit Mach 4 and help transition the aerodynamics to the scramjet. The United States might have dreamt of it, Still, it would seem that the Kremlin has actually built it. However, just like the son of Blackbird, 
The Kremlin's turbofan engine definitely requires an aircraft completely capable of carrying it with a scramjet paired to it to achieve hypersonic bliss. Hence the creation of the MiG-41. The Azdelia 30 was initially developed for the Sukhoi Su-57, Russia's first operational stealth fighter, which can also be used on the ground and for maritime strikes. However, as soon as the United States created their own non-operational hypersonic jets, Russia were desperate to be back at the top of the summit. Hence, they made the Izdelia 30, which would be forming a part of the Mikoyan Pak DP, or MiG-41, and coupled with a scramjet to achieve Mach 6, hitting hypersonic levels and beyond. However, before the MiG-41 is in production, the Kremlin sanctioned the creation of the Sudakov Su-57M, with reports of it being a possible testbed for the Izdelia 30 engine, where the thrust vectoring, fuel efficiency, and heat resistance will be tested to the limit before it is used in the MiG-41. The Kremlin has spent billions of dollars on creating the Su-57M, and more has reportedly gone into creating the perfect aerial beast in the MiG-41. While the Kremlin's hope for success cannot be overstated, some may have cautiously wondered why any country squanders billions on a particular aircraft just to see if it is capable of using their newly made engine. So far, it hasn't disappointed. Reports from flight tests of the Sudakov Su-57M were especially promising, creating the needed motivation to continue the MiG-51 project. Even after the evolution of warfare globally, with changes in how it is fought and won, certain aspects of war remain constant. Those aspects include intelligence gathering, stealth and reconnaissance missions, hence the need for a hypersonic fighter jet, which is equipped with multiple features, particularly for interception. The Kremlin developed the PAK Dash, DP, or MiG 41 to be interceptor jets and for good reasons. While aerial dominance is crucial to warfare, it needs to be focused on in two key areas, both offensively and defensively. However, the MiG 41 was built as an interceptor, a bullish attack dog, ferociously hunting down enemy aircraft in Kremlin airspace and readily equipped to destroy them. At the same time, these jets are tasked with engaging and neutralizing reconnaissance jets and bombers. They are equipped with sophisticated radar and other instruments to locate and track targets. Although most interceptors are fitted with armaments that are geared towards defending against aerial threats, the MiG-41 is equipped with an anti-missile laser, meaning that it could seek and destroy ordinances released from opposition aircraft and still strongly capable of destroying the plane that fired it, a multi-purpose weapon of destruction. While its capabilities in strike and combat missions are impeccable, huge concerns have been raised about the jet's ability to fly at higher altitudes. However, the Russian Air Force believes that the plane could travel at high altitudes between the stratopause and the tropopause, meaning that it could travel above 12,000 meters and below 45,000 meters. Although the aircraft could obviously travel at such high altitudes and do its job as a strike team, the Kremlin decided to equip the jet with an Izdelia 30 engine with a dual-mode scramjet or ramjet, giving it a chance to go even faster than Mach 6. Alas, the Kremlin has found its way into creating its own version of the Son of Blackbird's turbine-based combined circle, and it is so much better since it already functions. Although the engine gives a Mach 6, rumors suggest that the Kremlin may be thinking of even more speed with a possibility of spending more billions than they already did on the MiG-41. Although Russia's continuous sanction from the United States somewhat keeps them at bay, making one wonder what else they could have done if they had no economic and financial restrictions. Whether the world continues to watch Russia grow or the emergence of the MiG-41 sparks another arms race remains to be seen. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.